Thank you. What a treat to see a room full of improvisers. <laughs> it's so great. So we were introduced, but we didn't have a microphone on. We so. improvised and got some hooks. Oh, yeah, sorry I look a about little that. bit like the hunchback of Notre Dame right now, but yeah. it's OK. <laughs> you can't hear me? Can wow. you hear this? Yes. Can you hear this? Can you hear me? All right. OK. <laughs> Are you so. still up for this? <laughs> So we do, the, Laura and I do the Center for Communicating Science here at Stony Brook. And, and Aretha does violas improvising, teaches violas improvising. Now you all know viola, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so I just found out tonight that Aretha who's Viola's granddaughter, right? that she doesn't really know my connection to uh, Viola's work and to her father, Paul Sills. So I thought it would be fun for us to catch up with each other for the first time on stage here. We, we, we... Yeah, uh, yeah. I want to hear all the stories about how you worked with Paul Sills, my dad. Um, and, and learned Viola's work, how you became an improviser. I, it's funny, when I was on the stage, I always looked forward to a time when the other actor would forget to come on stage. <laughs> because I'd think, now I got the whole play to my... I got... Um, asked to be in an improvising group at Hyannisport while President Kennedy was still alive. And um, it was David Shepard who had helped start, he started the original Compass. The Compass, yep. They did the original Compass in Chicago, which then I think became Second City. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, he called this Compass at Hyannisport. And we worked in the basement of a hotel where earlier in the day, President Kennedy would give his press conferences. And in the basement that night, I would do him at a press conference that was in the <laughs> So the reporters would come to the show in the cabaret and ask me questions they had asked him, but they hadn't been in the paper yet, so I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was about a year after that that Paul asked me to do a workshop in the afternoon on the stage at Second City. And, and that was in New York, right? That was in New Second York. Second City yeah. had, had, had a show running in New York, I believe. Right, and, and we weren't part of the Second City company. It was Jane Alexander and... Uh, wow. Uh, sometimes people would drop in, but the ones who stuck were there, uh, Olympia Dukakis, Really wonderful people. Holy moly. And we, we, we would work, we'd work for like three hours at a time once a week, once or maybe twice a week, I think, for six months. And it changed my life, made me a different actor and it made me a different person. Because the thing of connecting with the other person is so fundamental to improvising. It turns out to be fundamental to communication and to living. <laughs> Right. You know, there's so often people try to communicate without that connection. It doesn't happen. So at what point along there were you born? Um. <laughs> <laughs> you said you met Alan once when you were one. I think I met you. I think, did you do some story theater in the Canadian yes, television? Yes, I did, yes. So I was one when that, I think that, so I was born in 1969. That's about when I did story theater. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. They had done it on Broadway, and then Paul did it on TV in... Uh, Vancouver and Canada. Really. Somewhere in Canada, on the West Coast. Yeah. And uh, that was a little, uh, that was difficult. Paul almost fired me and I almost quit. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> At one point, he said to me, what method are you using? <laughs> What'd you say? I said, uh, I just, I didn't say anything, but I, <laughs> I, just, I, went, I went off by myself and I thought, he's telling me in some strange way this is not lively enough. Mm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself the task. It's like I turned it into a viola game. The game was, I had to get a laugh every 15 seconds. <laughs> and then he came back and said, Still, what was the problem? That was fine. Ah, there you go. I never told him what I did. <laughs> yeah, he would have said, don't go for the laugh. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> <laughs> so so when, when did you worked. start teaching? Um, I started teaching, um, I, I worked with my dad a lot, and I would assist him sometimes when I was about... Um, probably about 20, 25 years ago. Um, uh, and it, but it took me a while to teach full time uh, because I had a, other stuff I did. I worked in the music industry and I'm a writer. I went to grad school, got my MFA in creative writing. Um, but in the last you know, 10 years, I've been primarily teaching full time. We used to do really interesting things when we were doing those sessions on the stage at Second City, the workshops, and Viola came and ran a couple of oh. sessions. Uh, but we would go to church basements to demonstrate it, and we would show them the, the, the exercises, the games. And then sometimes we'd just do a play that we didn't, we didn't know what it was going to be. It started in a place, and the place would transform, and then we'd be in a new scene and sometimes it would go on for an hour, and it would a wow. theme would develop, and characters would emerge, and story would happen. It was really wonderful. And not like what I've seen improvisers do now, where two people will be on stage and somebody off stage thinks, I know what I'll do, I'll introduce this new idea. Mm -hmm. And they come in with an agenda, this, and the scene would change. With us, the scene would change because the whole thing changed. The, the place changed, the, the activity changed, the attitudes, and it was all transformation, which it takes a long time to get used to. A very long time to, to work up to that. Did you guys play Transformation of Relationship? That game, was she doing that yet? I don't remember ever doing that. Mm -hmm. That might come later. Yeah. She might have been working up to it <laughs> with you guys. So after that, whenever I was in a company of actors, I would offer to teach a class. I did it in the, the musical I did that Mike Nichols directed, and we would get together every week or two and have a session. And, and everybody loved it. it. It really is so freeing, isn't it? Isn't it a wonderful experience? <laughs> yeah. And was that the musical you did with Barbara Harris, The yes. Apple Tree? Yeah, Barbara, yeah. of course, was an improviser. Yeah, <laughs> a great improviser. Great improviser. However, Barbara, when we were at Second City, I, was at Se I performed at Second City for just a couple of weeks while s somebody was on vacation or something. And uh, Barbara really, she, rightly so, felt her obligation in a cabaret was to get laughs. So... You know, we all worked with space, no props, you know, just imaginary. Yeah. So we're, the two of us were teenagers at a school dance, and it was really bombing. <laughs> I mean, it not only wasn't funny, it wasn't anything. It was <laughs> so Barbara, I didn't know she had something funny that she could do with the comb. So she said to me at one point in the scene, you got a comb? And I said, yeah, yeah, and I take an imaginary comb out and hand it to her. <laughs> and she said, don't you have a real comb? <laughs> so I was a little pissed off at that. You know, that's not what we, yeah. not the way we worked. <laughs> so I went off stage, I got her a comb, came back, and she teased her hair and got big laughs. <laughs> so then we had a scene, you know. We're not going to do that tonight. No. I haven't got enough hair for that. You got a comb? <laughs> That's all I need to hear. So that brings us sort of up to Laura, because 
Laura, who's the director of the Center for Communicating Science here, uh, is now uh, heading of uh, this center, which is in our 10th year. And we've trained 15,000 scientists. And Team over here too. Oh, Can y'all stand up? Oh, there's up? our team. Oh, stand, stand up a up. minute. Yay! Stand up! Stand up! These folks work so hard. They go around the world, all over the United States and in eight or nine other countries, and do one, two, and three day workshops at universities, corporations, wherever there are are scientists and physicians, people, all people in the medical profession. And they're, I don't know how you do it. They're on the road like 150 times a year. And it's extraordinary. So the way that started was, when I did Scientific American Frontiers, I realized that we had something that other shows didn't have. It wasn't an ordinary interview. It was, it was not me coming in with a list of questions and then going down the list, regardless of what they said. I went in really wanting to understand what they were talking about. And if I didn't get it, I'd shake them. I'd tell one guy I took by the truth, I don't get it, what are you talking about? <laughs> and that was really improvising, because mm -hmm. I was really there to understand. And I didn't care what the questions were that the producer wanted asked, I wanted to know what the guy could tell me or the woman could tell right. me. And once the, the, there was one scientist, and she was really doing interesting work. But she realized while she was talking to me, and we had real good contact together, she realized that what she was saying was a lot like a lecture she gave. And she turned away from me and looked right at the camera and started to lecture the camera. <laughs> so I pulled her back with some questions, and she came back, and we were together again. We were together, a normal <laughs> tone of voice, you know, like a real person. And then she turned right back to the camera. <laughs> And I realized what a difference it is when you're lecturing and when you're really having a conversation. A friend of mine who's a great teacher says, a lecture answers questions that nobody asks. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought when the show is over, wouldn't it be great to help scientists communicate their very important work that's really fascinating when you get the drift of it in ways that we could understand. And wouldn't the way to do it be to teach them to improvise as a, as a beginning and then teach them how to organize the message, teach them how to write, teach them how to talk in front of a camera, to be interviewed, to talk to politicians, to talk to one another. Collaboration among scientists is improved with this work. And we've been doing that for 10 So I tried it out first at USC with engineers, and mm -hmm. it worked. Just a three-hour session, and they were talking about their work with so much more clarity. And then we came, I came to Stony Brook, who decided to start the center. And I had 15 or 20 scientists from different fields. And we did six weeks of workshopping, three hours a week. They became improvisers. We did, a, <laughs> we did a show where they got up and improvised. That's so great. Yeah. And uh, Laura's been doing, you've been heading this group for t how many years now? Three. Three years. Are you, where, what countries have you been in this? We have been, all right, let me see if I can get this right. Ireland, Scotland, Israel, Germ Norway. Norway, we Norway, Germany. Germany. What am I forgetting? Honolulu. Australia. Honolulu's another country. <laughs> <laughs> I want a visa. <laughs> Canada. Canada, Australia. right, Canada. I did. Lydia remembers every scientist she ever trained. <laughs> <laughs> she does. It I has a wonderful people. effect on people. And now I do this podcast where I approach the idea of clarity and connection as the basis of communication, and I talked to all different kinds of people, a hostage negotiator from the FBI who uses these techniques, wow. not Viola's techniques, but things that are so similar, they're not foreign to one another. Mm -hmm. 
And this hostage negotiator says that the way he, the techniques he uses to release a hostage can be used very well in a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried it? Yeah, I'm going to be released in a week. <laughs> <laughs> Have you all heard of Alan's podcast, Clear and Vivid? Oh, nice. Awesome. I love doing it. So what have you learned from improvising that you've, what, like, do you have only actors come to you or do you, have you found that it's helpful to people in different fields? Um, I have people from all different fields come to my workshops. Um, it used to be primarily educators, I, a ton of teachers and some actors, and then a few improv people here and there. Um, I get more improv people now as they're sort of rediscovering Viola. Have you guys noticed that? Um, uh, right, <laughs> which is good. Um, and, but, but in my last, I just did a five-day intensive in um, L.A., and I had, I had two drama, like, uh, drama teachers who worked with kids in L.A. USD, which is our public school system. I had a, a climate scientist who works for NASA. Ah. I had a guy from... Um, uh, the, uh, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in London, who is researching um, uh, um, learning differences in actors. Like, he, he noticed that a lot of actors he'd been working with, uh, he, he guesses about 60% had a form of dyslexia. Um, and so he wanted to, he was... He was 60% of actors? Yeah. Isn't that, that interesting? Yeah, and I thought that actually uh, meshes with my experience, yeah, too. Yeah, well, they'd, they'd really be good to learn improv. Yeah. Yeah, so he, he uh, it, it, was, it was just, um, oh, and, a, and a, a professor of criminal justice who wants to use um, games to help. He's, he's, you know, he's teaching po future police officers that he wants to use theater games to teach them empathy. And so I just, I, I was, yeah. it was, wow, I know, right? <laughs> I know. I, it was such an encouraging week. That's wonderful. Um, and uh, as this is an encouraging week after a very tough uh, week in the world, right? I mean, are you guys all feeling that? Yes. It's nice to be here and see to see all the good work you guys are doing um, and and spreading this communication. Yeah, that's wonderful. I one of the things that we we've realized in our work is how hard it is to understand that when you know something really well, it's hard to believe that other people don't know it as well as you, right. which, yeah. <laughs> which, which leads to our using jargon or uh, using words that we assume. You know, that when they brought, um, words, words don't quite do it. When they brought, uh, for President Obama's brain initiative they brought together nanoscientists and neuroscientists to collaborate to find new ways to explore the brain and at their first meeting and at other meetings after that they wasted hours arguing over the meaning of the word probe <laughs> isn't that weird it's a normal english word but the, the nanoscientists meant something different from what the uh, the, the neuroscientists meant and we all, we all have that. I have it too. If I'm, if I'm at a dinner table and somebody next to me says, well, what, what is this uh, center thing you do, this communication thing? And I start to tell them, at least until, I started until I stopped myself from doing it. A boring version of it that is the <laughs> details. Of it, you know? right. Instead of telling them, we do these simple exercises like the mirroring exercise and a doctor a medical student was taking a tour with an older doctor who was a superior and the, the older doctor was telling this woman that she had cancer and was gonna not going to make it and she didn't react at all she didn't, didn't ask questions she didn't cry and the doctor felt he had done his work and was leaving and the student who had worked with us said, I don't think she got it. Do you mind if I go back and talk to her? So we went back and he sat in front of her and took her hands in his hands. He didn't say metastasis or any words that were technical. He just 
told her what was happening and a tear started to come down her face. And then she started asking questions. Mm. And he said, it was a mirroring exercise. She, I was, help, I was helping her die and she was helping me be a better doctor. Wow. So, I realized if I had told that story instead of the boring details of what we do, <laughs> that I'd make a better impression on the person next to me because we want to hear stories and we want to we want to hear it in a language we can understand. You made a gesture with your hand. Were you going to talk? No. Just I was scratching. Clapping for oh, you. clapping. I love that story. Yeah. That's a beautiful story. What is it about the mirror exercise do you think that's so helpful for your scientists? I think it's the that thing that I always do first because it's the first time somebody who hasn't done this before realizes you can actually pay closer attention to another person than you thought you could. Mm -hmm. And there's something about the experience of moving together, which is it's a fruitful experience. And when you each have a turn doing it, and then you realize you can do it without anybody leading it, that's an uncanny experience. <laughs> that's an experience that you think uh, that is not possible. In fact, I know, <clears throat> excuse me, I know a scientist in Israel called Uri Alon, who's a computational biologist and an improviser. He goes out every week and improvises in people's homes. They hear, they have somebody tell them their life story and then they act out their whole life. He, what was I gonna tell you about Uri? What he does with his group. Oh, oh I know what he did. He, he said, he was working, he was teaching some scientists the, the mirror exercise and said now nobody's leading. And even when they had the experience of nobody leading but still being in sync, they didn't believe it. They said, no, the, the, somebody's leading. <laughs> so he did an, a scientific experiment. He had a device made up. <laughs> we're, we're, we're opposite each other. You have a handle and I have a handle. And when I go like this, you mirror it, you go back. Or go maybe, back. It's, maybe it's toward me, I don't know. But one way or the other. So now this way, this way. And little by little, we're getting in sync. When one person is leading and the other person is following, the graph that's made from her movements, if she's following, has a jiggly line. The leader has a straight line. It's smoother. It makes sense. If you're following, you're more not sure where you're going. When you're both leading, both lines are straight. Neither one is jiggly. And it proved that you actually can be in sync without anybody leading. Now that's a strange experience. What's doing it? But it happens. It's been shown that it really happens. In the old days, we used to talk about mind reading. <laughs> you know, we were all into psychic phenomena in, right, in, right. in the 60s. <laughs> And, and once Those I used of us to, who were born. <laughs> I used to do an exercise where everybody would go off by themselves. This was definitely not Viola. This was me, me being 60s. Everybody would go off with a piece of paper and a pencil, and everybody would try to draw the same picture without knowing what anybody else was drawing. And we'd say, oh my God, eight of us drew cars. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Turns out everybody would drive a car no matter what you did. <laughs> it's an old mentalism trick. Of some yeah, sort, but, right? it, but it was a way of believing that we had some yeah. connection. But even Paul would sometimes say, we'd do a scene, and he'd say to people watching, what color was his shirt in the scene? You know, which you could only get telepathically. Yeah. But to a surprising extent, it seemed that you could get things that weren't literally presented. Well, the space objects become real, right? When they're communicated clearly, when they become visible to the audience, they are incredibly memorable to the audience, 
lives, right? I mean, at, at once, um, at one of my dad's memorials, when he, he died when he was 80, and at a memorial, um, one of his best friends from childhood talked about the first time he met Paul was Paul and a bunch of kids from Hull House were doing a little theater games display and they came to his school and he saw Paul and his friends and, and there was a tea kettle with steam coming out of it and he described in detail this like 72 years later he described the steam come the space steam coming off the space oh, tea kettle yeah right and so in some way those objects become you, you saw the steam real. you see it right and that's yeah. the when in those church basements we went to i remember when we were doing the workshop with paul for 6 months uh, we would show how uh, one after another, we would go up to a water fountain and turn the handle to drink the water. And because everybody was making sure that the where, the place, was the same for everybody, yeah. the people watching, ordinary civilians, could see the spout of water and how high it went. <laughs> yeah. And because we all could see it. And we all let it be there by the way we reacted to what the other people were doing it. I, it occurred to me that this was a kind of democracy, that things came into existence by our mutual agreement. Right. Yeah. It's just like democracy would be if we ever tried it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The reason I was almost late tonight is Donald Trump had visited the Hamptons and their traffic was totally tied up. Because in his honor, they made all the traffic lights red. <laughs> Make America wait again. <laughs> what do you No think? offense. <laughs> I think you're what, safe what in this crowd, right? What do you think right? improv has to offer democracy? Well, for one thing, what we've been talking about, paying attention. What we always tell the scientists when we work with them, a basic rule is to make your partner look good. Mm -hmm. That's absent in most uh, arguments. Yeah. Right? On Twitter. <laughs> On Twitter and, and even in life. <laughs> right. you know, I mean, some of the people I love the most get into a conversation with somebody who's not uh, progressive enough for them, and they start yelling at them. Yeah. Well, how are we going to solve anything if we don't respect the other person enough to listen? We got to listen to one another. Yeah. Absolutely. What do you think? Well, Viola said, "Play is democratic." With a rare exclamation yeah, mark. talk about that. That's, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, play is democratic. Um, and, and it goes back to what she learned from her teacher, Neva Boyd, um, at Hull House in, you know, in Chicago when she was very young. Um, Neva Boyd, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll go into this in more detail tomorrow in my talk, but Neva Boyd, um, she believed that children learn to work together through play. Right, and that she called it, uh, she, she said children develop social values through play, mm -hmm. meaning they'll argue over every little thing, and they will. I have an almost six-year-old, and it's, yeah, I mean, it's amazing what they'll fight over. But eventually, they will work it out because they'll be like, okay, well, we'll have two Elsas or whatever it is. <laughs> two, or, you know, <laughs> because they want to keep playing. The yeah. goal is built in. Right, and so this is something, and if you, we realize a lot of kids don't even get the opportunity to play that much anymore without adults coming in and saying, now you share, you do this, or, right? I mean, it, so it's, it's that idea that they, they, have to, they have to compromise. They have to come to some agreement, back to that they, idea they, of agreement. They experiment, right, that's partly experimenting with, with how you have to relate in life. Yeah. Uh, it's sometimes not so easy. I have a granddaughter who, when she was small, was a little bossy. <laughs> and her younger sisters w would have to do what she wanted to do. And I, I said, you, you know, you can't just tell them what to do. You have to say, what kind of game would you like to play? 
and, and, and meet them halfway. So she said, okay. So she said, who, who wants to play castle? And they said, we do. She said, okay, I'm the queen. <laughs> so that was preparing her for life. That's right. That's right. And when the other two storm off, right, she has to figure out, oh, how do I get them back here to yeah. play, right? <laughs> right? How do I keep this game going? Does she want my job? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. So, yeah, it, it, it's it's... It, it, and it goes back to Jane Addams, who was the, the great uh, progressive era activist who founded Hull House, um, you know, her idea of social ethics, which she talked about how um, we all, that she, her great book is Democracy and Social Ethics, and we all have to meet someone who's not like us. We have to meet people who are not like us and get to know them, yeah. get to know their needs, um, and, and that's how democracy is is and and she, function. Viola and Paul, too, played it out in the uh, way they ran the workshops. Uh, I, as I remember, Viola explicitly suggests that the leader of the workshop take part in it as one of the players, mm -hmm. which is not that easy to do. It's, 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 it's hard to come off the perch and right. say, I'm going to take the same risks you are. Yeah. And, uh, do you do that when you when you lead a class? Do you do, it's, it's 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 not easy to do, but it really can be valuable. Yep. And I, for me, one of the most valuable things is to to have the scene go dead, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then I wish for somebody to say, "Do you have a comb?" <laughs> <laughs> do you find yourself inventing new games? Um, no, I don't too much because I feel that my responsibility is to carry on Viola's work and Paul's work in a pure way because right. a, not a lot of people are doing that. Um, I do, I've developed like some different ways of teaching, like improvisation for writers where I, we place bowling games and then um, I created some writing exercises based on those games. Um, and, and that changes things a bit, and it brings in my experience having, you know, gone through an MFA program and learning um, why Viola's non-authoritarian teaching methods are so helpful, because I got the opposite in the MFA program, right? <laughs> um, uh, so how about a way to generate more new material and be excited yeah. about it than shutting it down and critiquing it only? So stuff like that, and I do a lot of uh, workshops for generating new material, and so we have fun with it and we play around with it. But I tend to feel that v just my role is to keep it pretty pure. Um, but how about you guys? Over the years, you've really introduced new um, exercises into the uh, program. Yeah, we have we have a specific objective, which is to get them either to get out in front of an audience or to write with the audience in mind and keep them always in mind. So you, you may be interested in talking about the way we've tiered, scaffolded the exercises. Yeah, I think what's really distinct about what we do is that we integrate design of message with improv so that, I mean, and we're walking, how many of you work with scientists at some point in your work? Oh, great. So, that. wow, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. I, I suspect you have a similar experience where you walk in and there's this look like, you're going to make me do that? <laughs> and then you've got to start off with something that doesn't feel too threatening and then move to the next and then to the next, and then you build more trust, and you can expand, and then do something that they can't imagine, like holding up a blank piece of paper and describing a picture, and everyone in the room is crying. And that feels really risky. If you walked in and did that, they wouldn't go along with it. Do you have similar experiences? So we've worked really carefully to, to craft it so that we integrate some cognitive processes which they really crave. They want to know, well, how do I do this? Well, take this and try it, but really have an experience of it. Yeah, we, we found it, pardon me for interrupting. No, go ahead. We, we had, we started with Viola's uh, 
approach, which was not to intellectualize it, just go through the experiences, which is the best way to do it if you have weeks or months yeah. to keep bringing them back. And as we found with scientists, they were so oriented toward verbalizing the experience. We, we settled, I think, for putting them through the experience without an explanation, but then talking about what it helped them accomplish, where it, where it put them, which made it easier, I think, for them to go to the next step, which w would require a little more from them, a little more opening up, a little more mm -hmm. giving to the other person. Right, we, we, yeah. we, 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 do, we do talk about it now, but yeah. not, not until after they've had the experience. I love telling them this is a non-talking exercise. <laughs> <laughs> They don't know what to do with that. And, and Laura, you were new to improvisation when yeah, you took this work I'm on? Like, work. I'm a communication researcher. I'm one of them. But, I mean, to me, it just makes sense that communication is not this thing you memorize. It's this relationship that you have. So when I saw this training the first time, it must have been five, six years ago, I was mesmerized by it. It made sense to me. And here I am. Yeah, well, she went back to her university and started a communication center. And then we realized how, what a strong leader she was and we asked her to take over the, the leadership of the center. And now the center's 10 and I'm 28 and Alan's 40. <laughs> I plan to live forever and so far I'm right on schedule. <laughs> I hear it's rare to live forever. <laughs> Are you going to try? <laughs> I don't know. So, so well, you were thinking of doing some, something yeah, similar you with the... Back in the Kutupa? Good, yes, but for the rest of it. Guska la kata jibarish? Akala wa yu wa. Guska la? Oh, yeah. Guska kanta ka jibarish? Oh yeah, they all speak gibberish. I can tell. <laughs> how do you how do you get somebody? If you want to play a little bit, that'd be fun. But I'm be, before I forget to ask you, how do you get people to understand they can speak gibberish? Because some people go uh uh, uh 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 and that's it. Well, sometimes in in workshop, I'll introduce gibberish one day with a short exercise, and I'll say, go home and talk to your cat, <laughs> talk to your dog, practice on your loved ones while you're driving, let your yeah. road rage come out in gibberish. I'll, <laughs> I'll give them a little time between because it, it can be very painful for people at first, right? Yeah. And, um, and Viola would recommend moving the jaw, you know, like... And, and you know what I've tried is having people stand in a circle and throw sounds to mm -hmm. one another, yeah, and then increase it so until it sounds more like vowels and syllables, yeah. and then put them together, and they pick it up from one another, and pretty soon, within five minutes, most of them are talking some form of gibberish. Oh, that sounds good. I like that idea. Now, the other thing we do is you, we have everybody in the audience turn to their neighbor and hold a conversation in gibberish. So should we do that here with these guys? Yeah. You turn to your neighbor and hold a conversation in j all in gibberish. Will you be my neighbor? Yeah. yeah. Well, so three and of us. Or three. Let's do it together. Maybe oh, there's three of you. That's fine, yeah. too. I don't judge, but I don't judge. 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 I don't Let them go for a second, and then we'll we'll do gibberish English. All right? You want to do that? You lead it. You lead it. I'll lead. Gibberish? I got that job. Blue. All right. All right. So can anybody whistle? Thank you. All right. That was a good whistling. All right. So these guys, do you want to play? Or you Look at this. They all I'm sort of volunteering. I didn't even. Well, they're holding up their hands to say it's time to be quiet. Oh. Right? 
Very good. All right. So um, you, we're going to play a little, just a short round of gibberish English. Do you want to play? You're, you're we'll in? Yes. One of them come Are you sure? Yes. All yeah. right. We need a volunteer. Don't be authoritarian. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you do this? I don't All know right, if I ever so did this. Gibberish English is uh, uh, two players are going to hold a conversation in English, and we'll take the topic from the audience. Um, but if they're called to switch. Uh, to gibberish. They'll switch to gibberish even if they're caught mid-syllable. Do we have a volunteer to speak gibberish with Alan Alda? All right, come on up here. Can I give him my mic? You're good. I think you're good. Oh, the mic. Yeah. Hi. What's your name? Joey. Yes. Hello, Joey. Yes. Oh, yeah. hey, I emailed you. Hi, yes. Joey. Yeah. I'm going to let you, I'm going to okay. stand behind, I'm going to hover behind you while you use my mic. We are linked at the hip. Why are we getting all this feedback? Uh-oh. Wait a minute. Is it me? Are the mics live? OK, let's do this. Let's get a mic. All right, they're getting Joey a mic. Oh, uh, here we go. All right, so. When you were uh, Arnold Pegg, you're the only yeah. Republican I would have voted for. <laughs> That's nice. There you go. OK, so now we're going to have a conversation in English, and you're going to yeah. call out something? Let's take a topic from the audience. Sure. Uh, uh, audience, we need a topic. Thunderstorms. I heard thunderstorms over here. Thunderstorms is the topic. And as Paul used to say, any topic you get from the audience can be elevated, right? So but we'll talk about thunderstorms. And um, I'll stand between you. Uh, so we're starting in gibberish. You're going to start in English. Okay. You started English. So I know uh, we had a two. Where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. They Brooklyn. have thunderstorms. Yeah. Yes, we do. Brooklyn. <laughs> Did you just have a huge thunderstorm? Yeah, oh, the other night it was an incredible gibberish. thunderstorm. Boom, boom, boom. English. All over the place. I know because I was in Brooklyn a couple Gibberish. of days ago. That's it, but Brochnik, this guy, I called him. English. I never got out of it alive. It was just amazing. <laughs> I was driving on, uh, I guess it was King's Highway. Gibberish. I was trying to get the Fodda, and you saw good there, but I can't jump a bakun. Bakun. Hail was coming down and hit the dashboard and hit the uh, glass and yeah, come into my yeah, did them off on ya. Yeah, I was just blowing the guy's butt. It's going to go like that. I had the same windshield. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. This was an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Joey. Where does this go? Back over here. <laughs> You're pretty fluent in gibberish, Alan. Huh? You're pretty fluent in gibberish. I, I, my gibberish is like Russian. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what would be interesting? To show you what I mean. This, I didn't invent this. This was, this was uh, figured out by a graduate student at Stanford about 20 years ago to show how difficult and how easy it can be to communicate something that's very complicated. You want to be a volunteer? <laughs> a volunteer. Hi, what's your name? Hi, Eileen, I'm Alan. Okay, one second. I'm going to write something down. Stay there. Don't go away. So you're going to communicate something to everybody here without words. It's a song. It's a song everybody knows. And you're just going to tap it out. Can you all hear that? If the song was Oh, Susanna, Oh, Susanna, but without the singing. And everybody will know what the song is. It's a, everybody knows this song. So this, how, how, this is a song, well, here. OK? How many people do you think are going to guess it? What percentage? 
65 to 70%. Okay, tap it out. Don't say if you know, don't say. <laughs> okay, okay, how many people think you know what it is? Those of you who think you know what it is, what is it? <laughs> Shall I continue? Now what is it? What'd they say? Star Spangled Banner. Yes, finally you got it. Now, what, <laughs> they all thought it was happy birthday. Now, <laughs> you, were, you were a perfect example of this uh, demonstration because almost everybody knows that what they're hearing in the tapping is they hear the melody. And they know that if they hear the melody, the other people hear the melody. And almost everybody says 60, 70, 80. Some people say 100%. And almost everybody in the audience thinks it's happy birthday. <laughs> because when we keep the melody to ourselves, we're leaving out the flesh and blood and the stuff that has emotion in it, that has the real communication. So you were perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Alan, Alan, while you're up, I. I feel like it might be fun to do what? a little bit of discussion about why that pitcher waters over there. Oh, well, you know, I, this is interesting. I was giving a talk one night uh, at, St at Stony Brook, the other campus, and we were on our way there. My wife was driving, and I said, I'm giving this talk about the essential element of playwriting, which to me is dramatic action, is the hero trying to achieve something but there's this obstacle in the way, and until you fight your way through the obstacle, you don't get to the conclusion of the play. You don't get the prize or not get the prize. And most of us, when we tell stories, leave that part out, the part. And also, an actor going on stage has to know what the objective is. If you don't have an objective in the scene, there's no scene. In improvising, in Viola's work, very often I think the objective is placed outside of you onto the, the rules of the game. It's the focus. The focus, yeah. right. That's what she calls it, the focus. Yeah. But there's, there's an objective, and you're busy doing something. Remember that, that, that first thing that I, when I have more time, I start the exercises with, where you just stand on the stage and just look at the audience. Yeah, exposure. And then you count backwards, right, internally. You can do that or count the floorboards. Right. And when you're involved in doing something like that, you open up. You're not fidgety and self-conscious because there's the action that you're doing. And then the same thing when in a play, when the hero or heroine is after an objective and fighting through this obstacle to get there, that's when we can't take our eyes off. That's when something interesting is happening. Here, just, you want to be a volunteer? <laughs> What's your name? Pam. Pam. Hi, Pam. I'm Alan. Hi. Come on, <laughs> Come on over here. Hold on to the glass. An empty glass. Wait here. Okay. Now carry the glass across the stage to the table here. Carry it over here. Excellent. <laughs> Hold it still. Hold it as level as you can. Very carefully, not yet. Very. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's full enough. Carry it to the other side of the stage, but don't spill a drop, or your entire village will die. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So which trip across the stage was more engaging? <laughs> I've seen audiences react when a drop of water goes down the side of the glass. You can hear them gasp. And everybody knows there's no village. <laughs> It's just this imaginary circumstance that's enough to make people care about the problem, about the obstacle. The obstacle is the glass in the water. You don't want to spill it. And it's such an interesting image to me. I was, I, I was, I made it up on the way to that talk that night because Arlene, my wife, said, "Well, start with an image of some kind." So I thought that was a good, that was good advice because it, it's really, it to me, it really helps you physicalize. The idea that you got to do something, that when you're up on the stage, if you're not doing something, not trying to accomplish something, things go dead. It really is, it really is what Barbara knew <laughs> when she knew that if she teased her hair and did something, it would be interesting. It would help. Yeah. <laughs> she couldn't do it with a make-believe comb. <laughs> I wonder if people have a few questions. We have a little bit for, of time for, 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 uh, for Arisa, either. Yeah, anybody. Yes. Why science? Well, because I love science, and I had that experience for 11 years doing the science program, and I saw that I could help the scientists uh, open up and sing the music and not just the tapping. and. I, I thought I was in a position to, to help, to do something that would be useful. And it, it was almost selfish because I want to understand science better. And if I can get them to explain it better, <laughs> it's like poetry. To me, it's, it, it's like, what if somebody said tomorrow there'll be no more music? We, we wouldn't stand for it. But we're living now through a time when, in the, for many of us, there's no science. And it's just as beautiful as music. So that's why. There's a lady in the balcony. One of the, the most important thing my father taught me. Improv. 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 No, my father. Because well, my you father. Can comment on your father. Her father. Her father, yes. Because <laughs> what my father taught me is not that interesting. He, 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 he was an actor, a very famous actor, and his advice to me was well, if you're going to be an actor, always find a place to sit down because your legs will get tired. <laughs> How Her father improv? taught me better things. <laughs> the most important thing I learned from improvising was discovering the moment rather than inventing the moment. That's great. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting to me to be, literally to find my performance in the other actor's eyes, to, to be able and not, sometimes more than others, sometimes not as much as I'd like, not, not always tuned in to the extent that I'd like to be. But when I'm really tuned in and the other person goes through the slightest change that may not even be conscious of, I'm changed, sometimes not consciously as well. But that interplay to be when the goal is to be as sensitive as a leaf in the wind and just move without deciding to, without telling your body what to do, there's an ecstasy to that. It's a wonderful thing to go through. And, and the doorway was open for me by improvisation. When, when actors, young actors, ask me what, where they should study or what, what kind of technique they should study, I always suggest they study improv. It's all I ever studied. I never, I couldn't afford to study at an acting school. I, the, th the only things I could afford were improv, which cost nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and, <laughs> and uh, I took a class in uh, mime from Etienne de Creux, the guy who had taught the famous French mime, what's his name? Marcel Marceau. Marcel Marceau. Marcel Marceau, wow. yeah. He's so quiet, I couldn't even say his name. <laughs> huh? Yeah, good. Yes. Now, here's what I hear. I'm bad of hearing. I'm hard of hearing. In 10, in ten years, years, what if the whole world, in Stanford Stravis... the entire world knows and loves improvisation. Ah. What do you think started that movement? What if what? What would have started that movement? What oh. do you think will start oh. that movement? Oh. Well, it would be me. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, you know. I'm sorry. I just... I, I went for the joke. <laughs> I went for the joke. I'm apologizing for you. It would be Aretha's grandma and father. <laughs> no, it'll be you. <laughs> so I guess we're done. Oh, that's you. Yeah. But no pressure. Well, you look eager to ask a question. One more question. Yes, I do. This is so interesting. I, I was asked to go to the uh, Lundfontein house in the Midwest, where they, they, it's now a museum, and they have a program where they bring actors together for a week from all over the country, really experienced actors with 30 and 40 years of experience. And they had somebody lead a week of work on some kind of a project. So one person did Shakespeare, another person did musical comedy. So I said I'd like to have a week where I work with them on spontaneity. Because I want to see actors be more spontaneous, more actors uh, go for that, you know, and be able to do it. So they were a little confused by that, the actors. They said, what does this mean, spontaneity? <laughs> I said, well, we're going to do improvising for a whole week. And they came anyway. <laughs> and I don't think any of them had improvised before. And these were very experienced actors. And one woman who was a very fine actress who had been on the stage for about 30, 35 years told me later she was thinking of faking a heart attack to get out of, <laughs> to get out of improvising. And I had said, if you want to bring a scene to work on, we can do that. But I wanted to do it through improvising. And, and I said, you wanted, you brought scenes, you wanted to do scenes. Most everybody said, no, no, we love the improvising. Just keep doing that. And she said, I'd like to do a scene. <laughs> so she had brought uh, a scene from Durenmatt's play, The Visit, mm -hmm. which is about a woman who's abused by a man, made pregnant by him, and he abandons her She's when she's a girl. Then she gets rich and comes back to the town to get vengeance. She hates him, she hates the baby she had from him. And it's a very fraught play. So they read the first scene, she and one of the other actors. And they were good, it was the first reading and they were good at it. And when she talked about the baby she hated, she, she, she meant it. And then I said, now let's do the scene that's not in the play that all of this stems from. When you're in the forest and he lets you know that he's dropping you. So they started the scene off the way most actors do, just writing dialogue on their feet. And they said, you know, use the place. Use the place more, and what you say will come out of you instead of deciding what it is. So they, start, they were in the forest, and they started to realize it was raining. And she was saying to him, don't you want to live with me? Don't you want to marry me? And he used the rain and he said, oh look, a little raindrop just touched the tip of your nose. He avoided her by using the rain. And she was crushed. And they stopped that and went back and they read the scene again. And now when she talked about the things that made her angry, she was furious. <laughs> Deep inside her, she was angry because she hadn't just imagined the circumstance that produced it, she had lived it. She had been through the real experience. And, and I, I, I thought I learned something that day. 
you know, and she, and she made, she had wanted to make a, fake a heart attack. She made the most progress of anybody <laughs> there. Now we have to go. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good. Good night. Thank you. Good night.